Okay, if you want to come and take a seat, we have a few more seats here available. Good morning and, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jean-Baptiste Thiebaud. I'm the director of ADC. And also I work at Volley as the director of developer products. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth edition of ADC. Um, <laughs> thank you. Our mission is to, to create the best global event focused on audio development technologies. And uh, we started in 2015 with about 100 developers that we invited from the Jews community to exchange about best practices around uh, audio development. And it has grown now to a big global community. Uh, and we have a record attendance today of 370 people. Uh, who has been to an ADC event before Jews Summit here? Wow. Welcome back, it's great to, to see you again. And for those of you who is, for, who is the first time, I hope uh, it's going to be a, a great event for you and that's going to be the first of many. Uh, ADC is a platform to showcase innovations ranging from audio for mobile apps to embedded audio, audio for games. We have talks, we also have uh, panels uh, as a place to discuss new ideas. And also we um, organize a lot of uh, social events for you to meet new people and learn from your peers. ADC's program is peer-reviewed, which means that the talks that you will see here have been reviewed by all of these people and uh, in a program that's chaired by Timur Dumler. So uh, being peer-reviewed means that we receive submissions in advance, we review them, all these experts give their opinion, and that creates the best program that uh, we, can, we can offer you, thanks to all of them. So I'd like to invite uh, all of you to give them a big round of applause for their work for the past four months. <laughs> We also have invited experts, keynote speakers. Um, so the first keynote speaker is Jules Storer. Jules is the founder of Juice um, and uh, the, the software architect at Raleigh. He has worked over the past two years on a groundbreaking technology which uh, he will unveil today. Um, the last session today, last keynote is by Dr. Marina Bossi from Karma, Stanford University. Uh, Marina did a PhD at IRCAM in Paris, and then uh, went on to join DigiDesign as a fifth employee, uh, and then worked at Dolby. She was also um, the CTO of MPEG LA, which is a consortium of industries uh, working at uh, creating the patent and technologies to encode and decode audio, which was instrumental in streaming technologies all the way to smart speakers, and our keynote is going to give an account of that. Oh, sorry, Aurelius. Uh, I forgot you. Aurelius Prochaska is a founder of AudioKid, also coming from uh, the San Francisco area. Uh, AudioKid is an open source framework for building audio applications for mobile. And uh, Aurelius is passionate about democratizing the tools for audio development, and which is what you're going to hear in his keynote. Uh, finally, we have Paul Bembro, who is going to give the keynote tomorrow night, the closing uh, keynote. Paul uh, started his career in the late 60s with SSL, uh, so it's State Logic, the console mixer company, and went on to uh, co-found Lightworks, the video editor, and Codex, and uh, also trained as an experimental psychologist and a film director. Uh, Paul is going to give an account of his career in the creative industries. We, we have launched a diversity program. Uh, we're committed to making the audio development community open to anyone and accessible to anyone. And with Ableton, Android Wally, and, and Spitfire, we offered 13 scholarship to people who couldn't have otherwise attended. We received many applications and we're very pleased to, to welcome them here uh, for this conference. We also uh, celebrate uh, women in audio and we have a lunch today that's open to anyone uh, to, to, uh, to celebrate their presence here. And uh, we will have a panel on the subject as well. Uh, we're very thankful to our sponsors. Without them, we couldn't have done this event. We have an exhibition space downstairs where many of them have uh, an exhibition, so I invite you to check it out. We also have a lot of community sponsors with who we are creating and nurturing that uh, global community. ADC is powered by Juice, and uh, Juice is a part of Rolly, along with F Expansion and Blend. Uh, two other acquisitions that Wally made. 
uh, Raleigh and Zeus are strategically uh, aligned, and both are aiming at making tools that are both better and easier. For Zeus, it means that our mission is to empower developers to build audio applications faster on all platforms. We recently uh, launched Juice 5.4, which supports iOS 12, macOS Mojave, Windows High DPI, and uh, Bluetooth MIDI. Rolly's mission uh, is to bring the joy of music making to everyone by innovating, starting first re by reimagining uh, the piano and uh, giving it more expressivity, and then launching Blocks, which is a modular system uh, of musical instrument connected to both desktop and mobile. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Roland Lamb as a founder and CEO of Rolly, uh, as a visionary behind the Seaboard blocks and also the acquisition uh, that we've made of Juice in particular. I had the, the pleasure of working with Roland for six years, uh, joining him as the fourth employee. And Roland is gonna come on stage and explain why uh, a developer community is important to us and introduce as well our groundbreaking technology that Jules is gonna announce later. So please join me in giving Ron a big round of applause. Thanks, David. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for all coming. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, I'm going to just give a little, mostly an introduction to Jules, a little bit of background on Roley um, and kind of how we got here. So. Um, in uh, 2009, um, I came to the RCA as a student. My background actually was in philosophy, but I was very interested in design, and I had always been a musician. Um, and at the RCA, pretty early on, I had this idea um, for a new kind of um, keyboard. I thought it would be really cool if um, you could kind of like bend the pitch and uh, if you could express more through the keyboard. Um, but I didn't have a background in design or in engineering, uh, and certainly not anything in software. So I didn't really know uh, how to make it a reality. So um, what I did instead uh, was, I, there was a, we were in, I was in the product design department, and one floor up there was an animation department. So I found one of the animators, uh, and I somehow convinced her to help me make a little um, animation of this idea that I had, uh, because I, I really didn't know how to make it a reality. So um, I'm going to show you that animation. And there's quite a few um, uh, members of the Roly team here, and most of whom I don't think have seen this either, because this was really part of my um, school project. But I think um, you'll get a sense of what I was thinking at the time. Oh, we need a little bit of audio here. Let's see. Should we try that again? So it was just like a dream, and it was both kind of quirky and grandiose, and you know. But I was like, I, I really want to make it a reality. Um, 
And so I started building prototypes and kind of uh, building like physical models. But when I got to the software component, I was even more like, you know, I had no idea how to get started. And so I started reading about software and different languages and frameworks. And um, I came across, you know, many different things. I, I learned about Juice at the time. Um, but it was clearly like way too complicated for me. And, um, and uh, you know, I also, um, thought that Jules looked a little bit too much like a movie star when I sort of saw his picture. But I thought, one day, you know, I want to meet Jules. Um, and so, you know, I, like, uh, figured out how to build a prototype. Um, in fact, actually, I, um, at first, I, I had about 1,000 pounds. I was a student, and I, um, I hired a software developer who cost 350 pounds a day. And, uh, and I showed him that video, and I was like, okay, we've got to make this. We've got two days, maybe two and a half days. Um, but after two days, he hadn't gotten anywhere. So I kind of gave up on that, and I learned a little bit about coding myself and just enough to make really basic prototypes. Um, and finally, I, you know, I got it to a point where uh, it was promising, and you know, then I started the company um, in around uh, 2012. Um, JB joined the team. Um, you know, we started bringing on um, some other team members and developers. Um, and you know, we set ourselves up to launch the Seaboard Grand, our first product in 2014. But in order to launch the Seaboard Grand, we needed a sound engine because it, you know, it was, we got the hardware to be kind of working, but um, to actually make the sounds work right was very difficult, especially given some of the constraints that uh, all of you are aware of around MIDI. Um, so um, we started building Equator, our first sound engine, um, and I, I, I remember Juice, and we talked about it, and we decided to use that as the framework. And then uh, through using it as the framework, we realized that Jules was down the road, and you know, got to meet him, and I was like super excited. I was going to get to meet Jules, and um, you know, then we uh, we became friends, and you know, spent more time, um, and uh, we both liked you know similar things, colorful shirts, and we, and many other things, and we basically just decided we wanted to work together. I think we had a sort of similar uh, approach to innovation, and I felt like um, working with Jules would be a great way to kind of establish um, some of the innovation. Uh, and the community uh, within a group of developers to make it easier for the hardware and the software to really talk together. Um, so that happened in, uh, around 2014. Um, but I guess, you know, what I wanted to say just in introducing Jules is that the Seaboard really came from um, asking, what is the future of the keyboard? What should a keyboard be like? What should an instrument be like in a digital age? Um, and in order to do that, um, you know, we had to establish this new protocol, MPE. And at the time, like looking back from when we got started, it seemed like, God, this is going to be impossible. It's a new MIDI protocol. You know, to actually get that to be formalized and get people to uh, start developing apps around that. But now um, there's hundreds of MPE apps. Um, you know, I think uh, probably a lot of people in the room know about MPE and have used it or are familiar with it. Um, and this idea of expressive instruments is now, you know, it's a thing in the industry. And we're really excited to have been a part of it. Um, you know, with blocks, we also ask the question, like, what's the future of the studio? In a digital and mobile age, how do we rethink, um, you know, the different components of a studio in a way that's accessible, you know, and portable and so forth? Um, but with, the, with that kind of uh, customizable nature of blocks, we needed an, another innovation to support that. And um, Jules uh, spearheaded our effort to create Littlefoot, um, a language that makes it really easy to um, create programs for blocks. And what's been really exciting about that is to see the way that developers have used that um, to create their own new instruments and their own innovations. And I started out as a kind of dreamer thinking about uh, you know, an instrument. And now um, other people in our community are using our, our technologies like to create um, you know, a new blocks cello and perform on that. And so we're really excited about that. And this, um, this creator actually is you know, some of our uh, you know, other developers who now have, um, just in our community, have created like playgrounds and other tools with our tools um, to make it even easier. And so that idea of kind of making things better and also lowering the barrier is a big part of what we do. Um, and really starting from the question of um, what should things be like? How, you know, how should we create the technologies of music creation and of audio? So um, with that kind of as an as a introduction, um, it's, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to get to, um, you know, today have us tell you a little bit about what we've been working on, um, an innovation that I think is very relevant to this community, and most of all to um, 
you know, introduce my uh, friend and esteemed colleague, Jules Storr. So big hand for Jules, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, the trick to get a good photograph of yourself is to live next door to one of the country's top portrait photographers and dog sit for them. <laughs> um, so ADC is always amazing fun. Um, this year, I'm really, really excited to be doing this talk. I wanted to do this talk last year. I've been wanting to do this talk for more than a year. I kind of half expected Roland to call me this morning and say, you know, Jules, actually, you know, maybe we should just keep it secret a bit longer. Because um, this is stuff we've been working on in stealth mode for, for two years now. So the topic today is um, our prediction of how people of the future are going to write and run their audio code. Um, I expect the way we do it to change really drastically. Uh, certainly that's going to happen within five or ten years, um, but hopefully sooner than that. It's not a talk about machine learning, and I know it's kind of strange to dare to do a conference talk this year that isn't about AI, um, especially when you claim to be talking about the future. Um, and sure, the future for audio will involve a bit of machine learning somewhere in there. But like watching all the hype around AI at the moment, it kind of seems to me that everyone's desperately trying to find ways to use it in audio, when there are actually some really more mundane, important problems that we need to solve first. It kind of feels like we're, we're all driving around in horse and carts, and everyone's putting all this innovative energy into trying making those into self-driving horse and carts, when the underlying vehicle that we use for audio is just a bit it's just a bit rubbish, it's a bit out of date and primitive. And we need a more modern foundation that we can start to build all this clever stuff on top of. So um, here's an image that um, you often see in um, talks about machine learning. It's, uh, I used this slide in my talk last year, and it illustrates the idea of a local maxima. And te technological progress can sometimes get stuck on a bump, where you know, you're going around in circles and there's a higher bump over there, but you it needs a kind of burst of energy to jump across to a better but different way of doing things. Now, the audio community has been wandering around on top of a uh, little low bump for quite a while now. We get our jobs done mostly by brute force, cunning, and a lot of um, persistence, but we have a lot of room for improvement. For most of my career, I kind of thought, okay, well, writing audio seems like it's difficult, messy, and the tools are really annoying, but you know, maybe audio is just inherently awkward to do. Um, surely, if there was an easier way, someone would have noticed it by now. Because nothing really has changed fundamentally in the way audio is done for more, more than 20 years. Um, you know, we've seen dozens of audio APIs come and go, all basically doing the same thing, varying degrees of ugliness, half of them from Microsoft. But after working on this stuff for about 15 years, with the constant nagging doubt at the back of my mind that it's all a bit rubbish, I think I've finally stumbled on that little, little that bit of lateral thinking that we needed to find that nearby higher peak. Um, so if I get this talk right today, what I want at the end is for you all to think, oh, well, that was, that was obvious. Um, and when I first came up with the idea, I was really annoyed at myself for not having this years and years ago. Um, it can be hard to judge how good an idea is, um, but sometimes a really good metric is how obvious it seems with hindsight. So it's easy not to notice when you're using tools that are bad. If you're a beginner, then everything is unfamiliar. You don't really know yet whether you're being dumb or what you're learning is just difficult, whether everybody else is being dumb and doing things the hard way. And when you get to be an expert and you spent years and years learning all the tricks of the trade, you can get comfortable with doing things that way and you stop wondering about whether you know, things could actually be better at all. So just in case anyone is thinking, oh, I think audio programming is a breeze, then to politely disagree, I'm going to spend a little time explaining why I think that. I could easily have made this like 20 fundamental problems, but we only have an hour, so I'm going to stop at two. <laughs> fundamental problem number one. Um, audio programming is just a lot harder than other types of programming. I mean, OK, there are lots of friendly tools you can use. You can go to MATLAB or Max or Super Collider processing. And you know, th these things are great for learning, but they don't really compete with C++ for either performance or the ability to actually turn those things into real apps that are flexible enough to, for the real world. So you know. People use those tools, and that's great for like, exploring your idea, trying out some, some, some mathematics. But then when it's actually time to build a real product, the professionals all pull out the big guns and go for the C++. And then the learning curve gets insanely steep. Um, I've managed to make a career out of trying to make things easier for people, 
but when beginners are hopeless at C++ itself, and they mostly are, um, then there's only so much we can do to stop them shooting themselves in the foot. So, but let's compare what we do in audio with the way people learn graphics and game programming. Now, if you want to learn about 3D graphics, you just open a browser, find a website like Shader Toy, and you start tinkering around. Um, there's nothing to install or worry about. Um, when you get a bit more serious, you might um, go up to something like Unity, which is still really friendly and safe to use, but you can actually re release real commercial products with that. The elite, like AAA games, obviously still use C++, but you can work your way up to difficulty levels. You can, you know, you can start simple and work your way up to the hard stuff. Now, in audio, we don't really have a difficulty level in between super colliders, don't hurt me, and um, insane mode, which might be like building an AX plugin or something like that. <clears throat> but ideally, we'd have some tools in the middle of that. Um, audio and gaming, they're both very complex, performance critical tasks. But over there in graphics land, they just seem to be doing a better job of actually sorting out the, the, the tools that they, they use. And even for those of us who are hardcore enough to select insane mode, um, we seem to do a lot of dumb things ourselves that make life harder for ourselves. We can't agree on a platform, so we've got, we collectively waste all this time dealing with VST, AU, AAX, and all those different audio APIs, and all the weird quirks, and all the doors. I mean, any one of those things is bad enough, but we all kind of spend time supporting all of them. It's like, really? We've got terrible problems with wheel reinvention. It's like completely normal for an audio programmer to write their own filters, oscillators, really fundamental building blocks. And, you know, games programmers, they don't write their own matrix calculations and, uh, or texture, texture interpolation. They, they have APIs that just do that for them. <clears throat> I mean, I wrote a whole framework, but that was in 2003. We didn't have one at the time. But actually, people are still writing whole audio graphics frameworks around their plugins now, this year. I met a guy the other day who's doing it in C. Um, most people who actually make a living in the industry actually end up not just being gurus in C, C++, but they, they have to know all the DSP maths, they have to know all the tricks of optimization, building, testing, setups. They need to know how to build a GUI and do UX design. They know all the multiple quirks of all the operating systems and all the doors they have to support. They probably run their own online marketplace because there's so many of that such so a fragmented market as well. And that's a, that's a tough skill set. It takes years and years, and it seems to be a skill set that mainly belongs to 40-something white male engineers with beards and poor dress sense. <laughs> and, you know, I'm perfectly good demographic. I'm, I'm in there. But surely we can, we can do better than that, right? Fundamental problem number two. This one, it, it's, this is a problem that gives us an unnecessarily low ceiling on the level of perform, performance that we can actually potentially get to. So, I mean, other than a handful of embedded DSP engineers, the majority of people in this room are going to be writing code that runs on a CPU. Um, now, CPUs, they're not terrible. You know, they can do some number crunching pretty well. Um, but they're running our audio code in the wrong place, both physically and virtually. So imagine you write, for example, like the most trivial gain plugin. Um, it just multiplies the input by a number. That bit of code you write that does the multiplication is going to end up running ridiculously far away from the actual business end of your audio system. There's probably a DSP in the computer somewhere that could just do that multiply with a single instruction where it needs to happen. No latency, just do it. But can we use it? Nope. That DSP probably just has the mundane job of packeting up the raw input data sending it over a bus to the CPU in packets. The packets somehow arrive in a kernel driver where they get poured into some kind of set of FIFOs and buffers. There'll be one or more threads will wake up, um, check if a buffer's free. Eventually, your thread in your app or some callback happens in user space, and your app eventually gets to actually do its little multiply. And then, if you're in the door, you've probably got another 10 layers of graph intermediate stuff to get through. Finally, your, your code runs. And then the results go all the way back to the machine and come, eventually come out of your speakers. I mean, this is an artist's impression, this diagram, but this, all, all, all this overhead is, is real. And I know that because I've written quite a lot of this overhead. I'm responsible for all that in a door. And it's very hard to actually avoid the overhead. And actually, you know, if you're actually trying to make a usable system. <laughs> and the problem with that fixed overhead is that it makes low latency very difficult. If you want super low latency, the CPU needs to wake up maybe a 1,000 times a second and do just a little bit of work. If there was no overhead, 
then it shouldn't matter whether you wake up once a second and do 1,000 units of work, or 1,000 times a second and do one unit of work. But when each unit of work has a big, each wake up has a big overhead, then that quickly adds up. And as you squeeze down your, uh, your intervals, the overhead dominates performance. And that's why our latency starts to, starts to crackle even when you're doing very, very simple audio tasks. So we have to compromise with big buffers and you get high latency. And that's a real shame. I mean, um, it's mainly live synth players who moan about latency, but um, having good latency is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a subtle but um, intangible improvement to most audio situations. You know, it makes your games feel snappier. It's really important for making VR feel real. It improves video and voice chat um, interactions and so on. So a quick digression from moaning. Um, in the world of semiconductors, they enjoyed many boom years where they got this wonderful, uh, the crude oil of performance flowed from the oil wells of Moore's law. They got basically, the transistors were just getting faster, everything was straightforward, everyone got rich and happy. But then the Moore's law party sort of ended and all the easy oil dried up. Um, but customers still want faster chips that use less power. And that means the semiconductor industry has had to work a lot harder to try and find places where it can force out further improvements. And the consensus over there seems to be that DSAs, or domain-specific architectures, are the, way, the place to look for these uh, remaining performance improvements. What that means is basically taking, uh, making some special-purpose special silicon that does one type of task really efficiently. Then you move all your code that used to run on the CPU to run on this special chip. GPUs are the classic um, DSA success story. And of course, there's a massive buzz at the moment around TPUs, where, which are accelerating machine learning tasks. Now, if only us audio people could take advantage of that trend and move all our audio tasks from CPUs onto things that can do the job better. If only those things existed. Well, they do. They're called DSPs. There are billions of them out there. And the irony is you've all probably got two in your pocket. You'll have one in your laptop, your phone, your smart speakers, your headphones, if they're Bluetooth, in your TV, in the CIA bugging devices concealed around your houses, in your car, your dog's probably got one. But it's almost impossible for you to actually run your own code on any of them. I mean, it might be possible that I could do some guru-level hackery to pop my own version of Android on this phone, get, somehow get some code onto its DSP, whatever that is. Um, but you know, it's kind of impractical, and it would only work on that one phone. So, and good luck trying to do that on an iPhone. <clears throat> but hang on, that phone also contains a GPU. How hard is it to compile and run code on my GPU? Well, go to a website like Shader Toy, type in some WebGL, and boom, like your phone is gonna miraculously compile that code and run it incredibly optimally on whatever GPU is in whatever random device you've got. Like, why don't we have that? But if things are as bad as I'm whinging about, why haven't we already got a better solution? Well, it's often hard to change the way we work, especially when a better solution involves a really big change of approach. And to justify making a really big change of approach, you need to offer a lot of benefits with your new solution. So you know, if you come up with a fantasy feature list for like the next generation audio technology, it's horrible. It's really daunting. Oh, how are we going to you know, do all of these things that people are going to want from it? But don't panic, because there just might be a little twist that unlocks all of these performance benefits and more. So, thought experiment. Um, forget how things are currently done. Let's imagine we're going to write the perfect hello world of audio. So what might that look like? Say we just want to play a beep. Simple oscillator just plays a sine wave at this beep. What is the cleanest, most meaningful way that we can express that? Well, um, the model we generally use for audio is to treat it as a graph of processing nodes with streams connecting them together. That works really well. Uh, most of the simple GUI tools that you use will take that sort of approach. It's kind of how we think about audio. So if I want to write some code that defines one of these processor nodes, what might that look like? Well, it's a processor. Let's call it a processor. We're gonna do a beep, so let's call it hello world beep. Um, what does this processor need to tell us? Well, it's gonna have to tell us what streams it can have. It's gonna have some input and output streams. And then it's gonna to have to have a bit of code to actually generate the audio. 
how about that? That says we've got an output for this beep. We're going to call it beep output. It's a stream of floats, which is the natural thing you want to um, spit out for audio. Now we need a little function to put in there as well, which is going to actually generate those samples. Let's call it process, because it's going to process some stuff. Let's do a loop. We're going to do a short beep, so let's loop 30,000 times. That's a little beep, a little length, just under a second. Uh, take a phase, we'll make a sign out of it. Push each sign of that phase into the output, move time along. That just loop, and then we're done. That's the simplest way I could possibly think of writing a beep. And that compared to how you'd write a beep doing pretty much any of the audio um, systems we currently use is different by hundreds of lines of code. Now you may have noticed that looks suspiciously like real code. And yes, you're right. So with a quick prayer to the gods of live demonstrations, I'm going to try and go to this computer. So I'm going to have the audio on here. Um, and I've had to use Bluetooth on this. Oh, it's like, this, this may or may not work. So here we go. Wow, processor beep. Let's see if this works. There is a beep. We declare our output, stream of floats, process. This is a little more than the last slide because I've actually got a frequency on here, but I might want to change this. Maybe I want to do it at 640 hertz. Oh, different beep. Let's try and make it shorter. Beep. OK, that's nice. Let's try something a bit more, a bit more complicated. We're talking about the future of audio. So let's play a futuristic tune. This is, this is what people will have on their phones in the future. <laughs> Here we're just looping around some notes. We're going to play this set of notes in, in order. So we note it next, find a note, loop for its length, squirt out some sine waves. Good, we're done. Oops, boom, stop. That's kind of fun. Let's try a more complex example. I don't know if this is, oh yes, it's going to work. So I've got a keyboard here plugged in. This is a little synthesizer. One day I'll learn to play the piano, not today. Um, we have a little graph here, because I was saying what you're really defining is a graph. Uh, this is a sine wave synthesizer, it's very simple. It does some pitch bend, it's polyphonic, but it doesn't really do much beyond that. And here we have a graph of other bits we're plumbing together. We've got a voice allocator in here. We've got uh, some, there's our voice allocator. We've got some voices. Each voice is a graph of other things which take events and handle them. We've got a gain processor there. What have we got here? Envelope, nice simple envelope. No clicking. Um, little sine wave oscillator. Some event handling that takes the notes on and offs and passes them to the voice allocator. A few types of event, that's it. Nice. Try a slightly more complicated example. This one's um, a synth with a pad sound. So here we've got pad synth. It's a little more complicated. It's got um, a reverb in here. It's also got a little filter in there. So this is a bit, bit more code. So we've got some parameters. We can actually have a bunch of um, parameters like you would for a plugin. Um, here's some oscillators with connected things together, events going around. There's a delay in there, that's nice. So just that here. Mixer, comb filter, all pass filter, which go into this reverb object. Again, a graph. All these graphs get plumbed together at the end. Got some notes ons and offs. I wish I could go into more detail, but that's a whole complicated pad synth, MPU compatible, in about a thousand lines of code. I think I've pushed the look with a live demo far enough now. So let me go back to. <clears throat> if we can go back to the slides. So what is this weird language I was writing? Um, well, it's our new language for sound. It's a sound language. Q. We call it soul sound language. Thank you very much. <laughs> our, um, our policy on the GC team is to only pick names for things that have potential for many terrible, terrible puns. And this one's a doozy. This is going to be good. If, if I ever run on stage to talk about this and they play Soul Man, kill me. <laughs> now, as soon as anyone mentions a new language, an understandable groan goes around the room, like, oh, God, not another one. 
And yes, you're right, the world does not need another general purpose language. Soul is not a general purpose language. We have some really big ambitions for it, but we are not uh, intending to replace any existing languages. We are going to augment them. So the seed for this whole project was to ask the question, what would an audio equivalent of OpenGL shader language look like? What would that do? Um, not a language that you'd use to write a whole app or a plugin, just a language for just the little real-time bit. Um, you'd embed that code in a normal program or a normal app, just like you do in OpenGL with shaders or OpenCL, very familiar pattern to a lot of programmers. Now, when we started exploring what this would actually allow you to do, we pretty soon realized that this idea of a sound language isn't just a good way to do it. It's kind of the only sensible way we should all be doing this. So after thinking, oh, what a great idea, my next thought was, oh my god, no one's done this. Someone will do this. What if they do it really badly? <laughs> and it would be really easy to do this badly. Um, if some big corporation spat out some clunky, awful committee design language that sort of works, but it's ugly, but they have enough muscle to actually make it a standard, I'm going to spend the rest of my career using it, hating it, and knowing that we could have done something better. So we decided we'd better have a crack at it. Now, I talked earlier about the fact that um, and if you're going to be, if you're pushing a new approach to something, you need to have a really big set of benefits to persuade people to give up their old tools. But when you start boiling all those, all those things down to what really lies underneath it, um, it largely falls into two categories. You've got ease of development and performance. And if you have a special language, uh, you can nail both of these. You can make it really easy to write. You can give it just the right syntax for audio. And a real-time language, because it has to be real-time, can and should be very simple. So the learning curve will be very, very shallow. There's no compiler needed for Sol. There's no build chain needed. It's probably a lot easier to learn than OpenGL SL. Um, and then the trick to getting the next generation performance and latency is you absolutely must push the processing away from the CPU down into the kernel, or preferably off the CPU onto a DSP or just something external. And the only realistic way you can send some code to be executed somewhere else like that is to use a language for it, which the destination can compile and prove not to be a security risk. Now, it took over a year to get the language design just right, and longer than that to actually implement it. But we're really satisfied with the way it's turning out. I mean, most experienced coders will be able to pick that up in five minutes. Probably you were all reading those, that code thinking, oh, I can tell what's going on, roughly. Um, and it's a lot of fun to write. So I'll give you a quick flavor now of how it all fits together and what it's going to enable us to do. The platform involves the sole language and the sole API. You'd write an app in your favorite language. It could be Java, C Sharp, Python, Quick Basic, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. You call the sole API, and you uh, ask it what audio devices are available, and you give it a chunk of sole code to run on the device. If you've ever used OpenGL, totally familiar pattern. And then the API has the job of finding an optimal way to run your code. So I'm going to now show you five different scenarios for what might happen to your code when the API tries to run it. Scenario one, and this is the worst case scenario, is that the uh, API will connect to your normal audio device, and it will have an internal JIT compiler, which will run the, um, run the sole code in your app. The little flame here is showing you where the sole code is actually running, where the work's happening. Um, I, want, I couldn't find a better icon than that. Um, so this is worst case. This is, any, any system could run this. But, uh, so this could be a JavaScript app or a Java app with a sole API in it running the code in there. Now, um, this is what I was using in the demo that I showed you just earlier. We're using the LLVM JIT, JIT engine in there. And we get performance that matches what we can do in C++. And in many cases, we, actually, we can actually beat C++ in a straight, in a straight fight for reasons that I'm, I'm not going to have time to talk about now, but over a beer later, we, we may do. Now, just matching C++ is a big deal in this case, because remember, this isn't a C++ app. This could be any language. Someone who doesn't know C++ and who, who's, who can write a bit of Sol, which is very easy, um, could write a React app or a, a Java app. And they'll get native audio performance out of it. And that'll run every bit as fast as I could write in C++. So that actually opens up the, the market of fast audio to a really, really large number of of developers who can't currently get it. But this is the worst case scenario. I have four more to go. 
I mean, making things easier and accessible, is, that's fine. But we don't want to just match native code. We want to make it eat our dirt. So you know the old proverb about teaching a man to fish? Here's my 2018 version of that. We need to push our code away from the, from, the, from, the, from the app. We need to push it deep down into the kernel, into the drivers, make it go away. Because down there, it can run with privileges that are normally forbidden to your user code. So scenario two is what would happen if we've got a sole aware driver installed on our device. So if possible, the API would like to pass the sole code straight down to a driver, let the driver compiler run it, and not your app. So that means there's no need for the driver to keep passing buffers up and down the stack in and out of your app. A driver has kernel privileges, so perhaps it can run it even on an interrupt. We've designed it so that could happen. <clears throat> or it could use a special thread priority that you can't allow user code to run on. Or it could just make smart decisions about the best buffer size. It could run it on a hot core of, uh, of a multi-core um, CPU. And I talked earlier about how the overheads always add up when you're communicating with a driver. So it's pretty safe to assume that letting the driver run the code will always be at least a bit faster than an app running it. Maybe not much, but how much difference can it make? Well, we did a bit of measuring, and we've been tinkering around with this, so seeing what happens on various devices. Obviously, things vary enormously depending on hundreds of factors, but we found some cases where we got really dramatic improvements. So um, OS X and iOS devices are pretty much doing the best job you could possibly do in a normal audio app at low latency. So the timings here are very, very good. Um, but we were, this is actually looking at um, best case latency, so with very low, si low loads and very small, unrealistically small buffer sizes. But that's a good benchmark. Um, so we've got iPhones, MacBooks, the, the newer uh, Android devices like the Pixel with A-Audio are not far behind. They've come on really, really far from their older devices. They're still a little way behind. And then we took, um, we took an old Nexus 6P, which is on the slow end of performance, but we managed to hack its kernel. So we moved, we ran our sole code deep inside the HAL rather than in user space, and we got a really big reduction. We got the latency down by a solid 40%. And also, amazingly, we saw that 75% of the CPU went away because it was all being burned sending this stuff up and down the stack. We didn't quite have time to hack the pixel yet, but we'd expect a smaller but still non-zero significant reduction in both of CPU and um, and uh, latency. Good luck hacking the iPhone, but um, you'd expect to, have to be able to scrape a bit off that performance at least. I'll come back to this chart again shortly. Um, two other important things to notice about this scenario. Uh, first, it, running in the driver changes the nature of a glitch. <clears throat> um, normally when jitter strikes, you're going to lose a block, and you're going to hear a click and a pop. Um, but when it's the driver generating its own data autonomously, it's much harder to starve it to the point where the stream gets interrupted. More likely, you're going to be under the same kind of load that would normally cause an audible click. Um, but in, in, this case, in this situation, the driver would carry on, and the things that would be delayed wouldn't be the audio itself. It would be MIDI messages reaching it on time or parameter changes reaching it on time. And you might get away with that without, without anyone actually noticing that at all. And secondly, um, the numbers before, it's when you've only got one app playing audio. And when you've only got one app playing audio, all the operating systems cheat. They pull sneaky tricks to put it on a fast path to cut out as much overhead as they possibly can. If you fire up two audio apps on most platforms, you're going to find the performance absolutely tanks and things get really nasty. But if there's a sole driver at the bottom, then any number of apps would give it their code, and it would compile the code together into a single program. So it makes no difference at all to the driver how many sole programs it's running at the same time. So this is looking pretty good now. Um, given special drivers, we can write an app in a really woolly language like JavaScript, but we can still get performance that's actually impossible in the best C++ app using current techniques. But why use any CPU at all? This is scenario three, where we imagine that our device has a DSP in it. Um, or even just a dedicated CPU core that has a RTOS running. If we can run our code on there, then we'll get all the advantages of scenario two, but the DSP being directly connected to the DAX is going to be able to hit latency that's basically zero. And it gives the CPU even more chance to relax and do power-saving tricks and other, other interesting work. 
But the thing is, that, that sounds like I'm speculating about some new piece of hardware. That's not imaginary. All our phones are already built in, you know, they have the stuff on the motherboard that could do this. We're just not allowed to run it. <coughs> but we're not actually finished yet. Scenario four is to push the code right out of the host machine altogether. If we build um, a sound, car sound card or a smart speaker or a pair of headphones um, with some sort of processor in it, then we can run the code on there. Maybe we could have uh, a big rack in a studio with Xeons and some you know, power-hungry DSPs in there. I mean, that would be incredibly fast. Um, if that runs a bare metal operating system, then it's going to get basically zero latency. And on your, on your laptop, controlling it, your CPU is going to go down to basically nothing. And, so, and even the feeblest mobile phone could control a huge rack of audio doing some really, really complicated um, synthesis. And that will work on any machine without special drivers, if you could talk about across a network to this thing. And it needn't even be a powerful DSP to be useful. Um, a really annoying thing about Bluetooth headphones is you have this two, 300 millisecond delay to keep the audio stream running between them. And that can make games quite laggy. Um, if, the, if, your, if, if your headphones had a, at least a, a powerful enough chip in there to actually run some simple game sounds, then all you'd have to send it are, are little triggers to say start and stop. And all that lag would really re be reduced quite massively. Coming back to this slide, we actually have a prototype um, system of this out-of-the-box processing running. Um, we built Sol with a client-server architecture so we can happily run it, the code on a different machine to whatever we're, we're running on. And that could be a mobile device or a bare-bones device. The, the, the um, figure I've added at the end here is a Bella board that we ran Sol on. A Bella board is like a little $100 bare development board with, a, with an ARM chip on it. Uh, that runs a real-time version of Linux and gets it just destroys everything else in latency. And it does it with utterly stable load. You can push it to 90% and it won't actually uh, start glitching. Uh, so, you know, the, the architecture, and an architecture like that also doesn't just work well at low latency or get better latencies. You kind of, you just run it at low latency because it doesn't make much difference to the thing to increase it. It doesn't really help much. So you just, low latency would become a normal thing, not, some, not a special thing you would opt into for a, for a special app. <laughs> and final scenario, apparently this, this internet thing is finally catching on, and people are wanting to run some code in their browsers these days. We can do that too. So we've made sure that our um, compiler will happily be built as a JavaScript library, so you could run it in pure JavaScript, converting, translating Sol, compiling Sol into WebAssembly and running it via Web Audio. That will work in any old browser. If you actually use WebSockets to talk to a local box um, that has a sole processor in it, then you can then get all of that wonderful acceleration, basically run any old app in your browser and get super high performance, more than C++ performance, zero latency, external processing happening with it. And of course, if one day we could integrate the sole API into the browser itself, you'll get all the other benefits, and we could run native speed code on your, on your machine itself. <laughs> so those are five scenarios that are all an improvement on what we're doing at the moment. Um, and the really neat thing about them is that the original programmer who wrote the Sol code didn't have to know any of that. They just wrote one piece of Sol code, and the API took care of figuring out how and where it should run. OK, that was apps. Now, lots of plugin developers here. Let's talk about plugins. In the short term, um, there are some obvious things we can do. For example, we'll have a tool that takes a sole program and spits out some C++ and juice and some boilerplate so you can compile it into a VST or an AU. That's fun. That's good. It's handy. You can prototype things quickly, finish code, live code it, bake it into C++. Fun, but it's not going to revolutionize anything. But imagine that we have a bundle of files and resources that was mainly, say, JavaScript code that can create a GUI using standard web tech, HTML, CSS, and which can also emit some Sol code to do some DSP work. That bundle is everything you need to build a plugin. And then if we write a Sol hosting plugin, then it could load those bundles dynamically. Uh, it could use something like Chrome Engine to draw, let them draw their GUIs, and it would JIT compile their Sol code um, and run it at C++ native speeds. 
um, and the rest of the glue code could run in JavaScript because it doesn't have to be fast. There'd be no need to install or compile these bundles. Um, it would be dramatically easier to write them than to build a VST or an AU. And they'd be able to do just as much and run just as fast. Now, that starts to make things quite interesting. <laughs> Next, imagine that the door itself actually recognizes that bundle format. Then the door could run a big session with lots and lots of these sole plugins in, a big, in its big playback graph. But all that code could be linked together into one sole program. That lets the JIT compiler optimize across third-party boundaries, so these things are no longer black boxes. And of course, you can send the whole thing off to an external sole device to run it with zero latency and free up your CPU. Now, you remember when some websites didn't work unless you had the Flash plugin installed or Silverlight? That wasn't so long ago. And I think we're going to head in the same direction for sounds. I think one day it'll be funny to remember how sound designers used to create a patch that would only work when you'd installed the right plugin in your door. Because once you've got a plugin format with no native code, that's just a bundle of files, the lines start to get a bit blurry between what a plugin is and what a sound or a patch is. I think where we're going to end up is that sound designers will provide sounds not as patches for a plugin, but as just a self-contained bundle. All the synth code that that sound needs to, to play itself could be in the bundle, um, or it could, be, it could be a URL that the door pulls it in from. The user wouldn't have to be aware of any of that, just like website visitors aren't aware of all the JavaScript libraries that are running behind the scenes in a website. And just like a web designer builds content by gluing their content together with a bunch of JavaScript frameworks, sound designers will find or license chunks of DSP engine code that they put together and bundle up with their other resources to build the sounds that they're trying to create. Now, obviously, all of this stuff would be useless if we could only use it to build toy projects. Um, so before getting too carried away, um, we did some diligence to actually convince ourselves that, yeah, this will work for really properly serious audio apps as well. I mean, probably the most complex audio apps that exist are doors. Could you build a door with Sol? Well, the only way to prove that will be to build one, and that's going to take a little while. But um, having spent most of my adult life working on the door engine in traction, I've got quite a bit of insight into where the difficult bits are. So we've used that experience to make sure the language will be up to all the, all the nasty jobs that it would have to do for this kind of use case. Now, we do actually claim that Sol can beat C++ in a straight contest in many cases. Um, one day, I would love to do a whole hour on that topic and properly geek about compiler optimizations and how the uh, cache-friendly block of memory can really make the difference. Um, maybe in the bar later over beer, if anyone's really into this stuff, we can, we can ramble on about this for hours, but I have no time to do it just now. We'd also need a whole talk um, about all the fun language tricks itself that we're really proud of in here. And I look forward to covering all of these topics one day, but it's um, way beyond the scope of this talk. So hopefully by now, at least a few of you will be liking the sound of this. Um, we're going to start releasing some actual stuff for you to play with early next year. Um, we've got a website open. I'll give you the URL at the end. Um, it's worth noting it's a, this is going to be a really long-term project. Um, it's taken two years to get to the point where we felt it's ready to talk about. And even if things go perfectly well and everybody loves it immediately, it's still going to take years to grow uh, a proper mature ecosystem of supported devices and all the tools and uh, things that that makes possible, and a community of people writing and sharing soul code. And to achieve that, the only sensible strategy is for us to be really open about it and invite collaboration. We've got way more cool ideas for tools that we could build with Sol than we could possibly build ourselves. So it's going to have to be a community effort. And if you'd like to get involved, please do come and talk to us. If, if the whole thing is making your hackles rise, then also please come and tell us why. Tell us what you don't like. I mean, Another reason for announcing it as, as early as we are doing is that we've got a chance to swerve around any mistakes that we might have, if we've overlooked something silly. We can, we can probably just correct that before we actually release stuff. Um, if you're just not impressed, then uh, that would also be really interesting to hear about. Um, I think we're going to get a common criticism, which is on the practical side. Like, I've got a 10 million line code base that can never be ported to even another version of C++, so this has no relevance to my life. Um, yeah, fair enough. Um, there are, there are billions, of, billions of lines of COBOL running in all those banks for that reason. And you know, sorry, 
But we do want to make sure that Sol could be a better replacement for pretty much any existing use case if people have the time and the inclination to port it. Um, and I hope some people will choose to, to make that effort when we're, when we're uh, actually rolling with this. And for new projects, we're really keen to make sure we do everything we can to make Sol the absolute no-brainer platform choice, not just for beginners, but for um, professionals as well. I would happily bet money that in the not too distant future, everyone here will be writing all their audio code in a special language. The pieces just fit together far too nicely for that not to happen. If Sol doesn't become that language, then something else will. Uh, and believe me, it's going to be uglier than this. <laughs> so if we fail, and in a few years you turn up for work, and your boss tells you, oh, today we're going to start rewriting all our code in audio PHP, <laughs> or, or, or visual basic for audio, then I hope you'll at least remember what we're trying to do here with this and how different things could have been. <laughs> I wish I had more time today to actually properly show off the language itself rather than just scrolling quickly up and down through some files. That's the really fun stuff. That's what I, I absolutely love about this. But hopefully all this big picture stuff has been enough to make you think, oh, yeah, that's obvious. I could have thought of that. Um, we're still in teaser mode with it. Um, so we're not releasing much detail yet. We'll, we'll let that leak out over the next few months. But if you want to keep updated with our progress, we have a website, sollang.org. Um, all comes to juice. You'll find us there. And uh, so if you think you could be a potential partner, early adopter, bitter sworn enemy to the death, uh, we'd love to hear from you and talk about that. And um, for all of you guys at ADC here, I look forward to lots of interesting conversations over the next couple of days. And have a great conference. Thank you. I'm, I'm terrified to learn that there's time for questions. <laughs> I was, I was for hoping questions? I'd drag it on to the point where we couldn't do this, but OK, go for it. So uh, can we have a microphone to circulate in the audience? Is this one? OK. So do we have any questions for Jules? OK. And then we have one hi, here. Hi, I'm Yella from DTS. Um, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. So I have a question. When this, I, I wrote my Soul app, and it's running now brilliantly on my Soul-enabled speaker. How do I debug it? Well, we'll have to write a debugger. I mean, <laughs> how, do you deb how, do you debug any, how do you debug OpenGL? That's running on a GPU. We'll, we'll, we'll solve that problem. Um, there are lots of tricks. We've obviously thought this through in, in excruciating detail. Um, there'll certainly be ways you can, uh, we can em have really nice debugging tools that run the code locally and emulate what's going on and then let you really dig into the numbers. If it goes off to some embedded device, it's going to be very hard to remotely attach a GDB type thing to it. Maybe that's possible. Um, but I think it's kind of the same problem you're going to get with um, OpenCL, OpenGL, and those guys have solved it. It's hard. Hopefully someone other than me will do that hard bit. Um, but we, we will build the buggers for it. We'll, there's lots of really cool tools we can build for this. Uh, stuff that you can't do in native code as well, like, time, like being able to roll time backwards and forwards and saving all the states. There's really, really fun stuff. Cool, thank you. Sophie, Sophie, over here. Yes, it sounds absolutely fantastic. Have you done any work to support samples and sample libraries? Um, yeah, we, we, samples will be um, a type of object in the language called a resource. We've figured out how that's going to work. Um, we're still working on that bit of the code, but um, we've, we've got a plan for basically streaming. There's, you're going to need to stream data from a computer to wherever it's being played. Um, we think that streaming the data itself makes more sense than streaming the finished result. So, but it will be, um, a, it'll be taken care of by the API. You'll just, it'll be like, kind of like using a texture in OpenGL. You declare it, you just ask for numbers from that sample, and a callback might happen in your actual app that, that provides the numbers. Brilliant, thanks. Another question over there. Uh, do you have any plan for offline compiling so that I can don't have to ship the source code, my sole source code, with my application? We, we do have an intermediate language. So actually, yeah, there's a kind of assembly language level that was what will actually be sent. 
Um, so yeah, I, I know that was a problem with the OpenGL SL guys, and um, uh, yeah, we already have, we, part of the way it works is this intermediate language that I've not, I didn't go into here, but it's a whole hour talk in itself. And that's um, on the kind of level of LLVM IR, so it's basically, that you'd, be, you'd be safe shipping that. Thank you. Right. We have a question over here? Oh, one more at the back, sorry. Wow, uh, latency. So, do you have algorithm, excuse me, abstractions to handle things like convolution reverbs, where the algorithm itself has to be done in high latency blocks? Um, we'll, we'll have um, a buffering system so that um, we're going to abstract the the use the FIFOs out of your out of your code. So you you could manually write a FIFO in Sol, but we'll we kind of encouraging. We'll have part, you'll build it into the graph, so you'll have. Um, uh, we're, I don't want to get too techy here. We'll have windowing, windowed, called, uh, windowed streams and streams that introduce delays. So you can kind of construct the, that kind of um, algorithm using building blocks that then get implemented by the API in ways that you can be optimized more than you writing it manually in C++, basically. Um, it, it requires like a, a long answer, that one. But we have, we have got a plan for that, yeah. Question over there. One last question. Hi, thanks for the talk so much. I was wondering if you had any early thinking on licensing terms. You mentioned you want it to be community driven. Yeah, well, I mean, it's Im impossible really to launch a language unless developers feel it's utterly frictionless to just start using it. So the, the, definitely the end, the stuff that you need as a developer to use this will be completely um, liberally licensed. It would, it would be crazy for us not to do that. Um, what actually happens in terms of drivers and stuff It'll, there'll be a, that'll be where all the complicated, messy stuff is, but that'll be hidden from the user-facing side. Thanks. All right. Th thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, thank Jules again and get on. <laughs> thank you very much.